Hello, hello, hi guys, uh, just checking in, getting it going for our 4 o'clock, I am Tony Leonard, uh, the presenter for this uh, time slot for ZBrush Live, I am a 2D, 3D concept artist based out of Los Angeles, uh, and also I've been known to dabble in comics, uh, but uh, today I'm going to be taking you through a uh, few moves with the uh, ZBrush, but I just wanted to give us everything a second and make sure I am streaming okay and everybody can follow along. Oop, I need to mute myself over here. There we go. So I'm going to keep my eye on the chat and see if anybody's uh, logged in, but if you are watching, do drop a line in the chat and let me know. Hello, Albert. Oh, sweet. All good on Twitch. Awesome. Okay, so um, over the last week, uh, I gave some thought to some of the moves that I was doing in uh, the last video, which is about probably two weeks ago, the weekend before last, I believe it was, uh, I believe on the 17th, uh, and I moved on with a couple of other different experiments. So last time I covered doing a, a few uh, R8-fashioned uh, booleans, but this time around I've been uh, dabbling with them. Um, trying to create some surfacing, uh, some shortcuts for creating like uh, uh, certain panels using panel looping uh, and also zero-mesher settings uh, that you can use to quickly chop up uh, a concept mesh uh, and produce some uh, sort of at least reasonable geometry uh, for sort of bringing a, a modular na uh, nature to some of your hard surface designs. So uh, I've also rendered out some things in Keyshot and I'm going to sort of take you through what I'm setting up uh, on that side of things uh, as is the image on my screen. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, let me know. But I'm going to go and show you how I kind of built this model and set it up. So if everything is cool, if you guys read me okay, I'll progress and move on. So. Give me just one second here. I'm gonna flip over to Keyshot, and for Keyshot, or excuse me, I'm sorry, ZBrush. I'm gonna flip over to ZBrush. Derp. Um, this is pretty much the concept model that I have going, and that I'm shooting over to uh, Keyshot. And in this, give it a second there. It's gotten a little big. I'm gonna turn on Dynamic Solo so it can move around the viewport a little faster. So as you can see, I have one concept mesh sculpt that was basically made from a polysphere. Uh, it just took like maybe about two hours and did some, uh, uh, used some clay, also hard polish, Damien Standard, and really just treating uh, the sphere as I contoured it um, as sort of like a, a starting point, uh, you know, using Dynamesh, uh, surfacing out things, uh, maybe dividing or giving it a little bit more geometry by changing the values of Dynamesh. Uh, now that we are in our awesome uh, 2018 release for ZBrush, I uh, hope everybody's upgraded. Um, how important are 2D skills for 3D sculpting? That is a great question uh, to start with. So I'm going to work on this a little bit and hopefully I'll answer that in a, in a good fashion. Um, yes, 2D skills can always lend themselves to 3D skills, in my opinion. Um, why being that with 2D you start to learn a lot of fundamentals about design uh, and how to use and inform your shape language uh, and you can use drawing as sort of a test bed for whatever you do in 3D. So a lot of times uh, I kind of treat or approach a lot of my sculpts from the way of like uh, how I draw things um, by hand and a lot of times you know I'll sketch things out uh, you know, with a brush pen, uh, I'm particular to <laughs> or known uh, well for you know commanding a, a Pentel pocket brush pen uh, and Copic marker a lot of the time. Uh, maybe I might use tech pens and stuff like that, but I use all of those skills uh, forward into designing. You know, in 3D, so uh, something like this I treat it in the same way. I'm looking at which shapes look a little bit more aggressive, which are more forward or swept back. Uh, which forms lend into each other, uh, thinking even about, uh, even though this is sort of an inanimate, more non-human, humanoid form, 
uh, I'm still thinking about you know sort of uh, basic regions of uh, proportion and without having some skill of 2D uh, and or practiced a live uh, anatomy drawing or um, drawing you know in perspective uh, you know and also semi-contour forms I'm a big proponent to drawing and semi-contour being able to to uh, you know build up shapes Uh, actually, you know what, uh, as far as um, workspaces go, a lot of times I stay between Maya and ZBrush, uh, and then I use a couple of other supportive apps. Um, Quixel is one, uh, you know, I use things like Nald, uh, a couple of other apps, you know, for fine-tuning uh, different uh, areas uh, of a design. But generally, a lot of times for 3D, I start in ZBrush because I get the easiest, quickest contouring out of shapes. Uh, and again, this is a conversation that goes back to form language, but to do all of my form language, I, I, I get that done in ZBrush, and then I used uh, Maya or something like that for a little bit more technical stuff, uh, sometimes like UV or topology, what have you. Uh, also extra editing of uh, loops and actual poly editing, I use Maya quite a bit, but I actually don't use Max. I, I haven't even tried to, <laughs> to learn Max, quite honestly. But, okay. So um, this sculpt here, I should probably go up. So I'm gonna actually shift and click all of the visible meshes. And then I'm gonna go up and select at the very top uh, one of the first drafts that I made, right? Uh, and this is the whole piece as it is at its resolution. So this is a Dynamesh, it's not uh, very high, I think. Or actually it is kind of high. I changed it to 880, probably from something a little bit lower, that's why. In some areas where I've used Damien Standard, uh, there's a little bit of pinching, uh, and the surfaces are not super clean. But I could uh, smooth this out, and one of the things that, I'm not gonna talk too much about uh, 2018 features as of yet, because there's still some stuff that I'm investigating with it myself. Uh, I've only, you know, had, what, probably the last 48 hours or so to play with it. Ah, oh, no worries, no worries, cheers. And um, so with this, you know, Generally, if I was to do like an actual model, or uh, I suppose if you wanted to do a 3D print, or if you wanted to do uh, like sort of an in-game or you know just like a marmoset style render, you know you would have to probably work on some of the surfacing because a lot of this is very rough still, and so to do some uh, secondary and tertiary forms as far as uh, refining shapes, uh, you would probably have to pluck out individual parts, right, and work those up, sculpt those up. Uh, maybe you, if you're going to render someplace like uh, Marmoset or otherwise, even if you don't have UVs set to these, uh, you can block things out in chunks and refine some of the shapes. So this was uh, the initial sculpt that I did from a polysphere. I probably cut it here at this line, uh, undo this cap, and maybe I could attach it to a body if I was to progress that way, and that's entirely possible, right? So just to kind of show you know what a rough uh, concept mesh is and how I'm building this up, this has been my starting point, right? So if I turn on and hit shift and look at my polygroups, I'm actually trying to um, do a method of uh, that I think I believe I saw by Marco Plouffe, uh, which had some great content uh, in one of his tutorials. Uh, hey, how's it going? Cheers. Um, so. As I'm cutting things up, what I'm doing is actually just taking uh, the poly paint and hitting up uh, hitting up some of the lines in this with black, right? And so I kept these and saved these out because I thought it would be interesting for you guys to see. But this is kind of a, a neat trick that you can do. So when you have paneling. A lot of these, you know, even if you're using uh, panel loops or, or if you're going to cut the geometry straight out uh, or if you're just using the shapes as contouring, uh, I've done a, a lazy mouse brush and gone in between the sections and drew just straight up in black. Uh, and this is because uh, as I was watching uh, Marco's uh, workflow, it totally made sense to me that you could actually go down to masking. Uh, and with masking, you could mask by intensity. So, um, I believe should be in here. Peaks and valleys, max by alpha. Oh, I 
forgot where it was. I'm trying to remember which which group it was. Really quick. But there's one of these has uh, mask by intensity. Uh, and basically what that does is it just yeah there we go mask by color mask by intensity so with this if I hit this uh, let me go back up and I'll hide the poly paint as you can see the mask has all of the cut lines and I just created a poly group from this and then hit it uh, and then when I hit it I left it as just like a line as its own poly group so that way I could show hide it uh, and take other parts and show hide them uh, and pluck out a singular piece. So, cool thing being like if I took a large chunk, like uh, let's say I'm going to click on one panel here and we'll try this process. Yes, mask by color then intensity. Thank you. Yeah, I remembered. <laughs> Took me a second to remember where it was. Uh, so this is pretty dense, but I just need to select one piece out of this. Amazing. There we go. Oh, sort of the reverse of what I wanted. Yeah, click it again, and it should invert. Come on. Ooh. Come on, come on. Click it. Yeah, craziness. Alright, so actually, for some reason, this is moving mad slow. So I'm just going to actually grab one side and then I'll mask it off. That should be easier. There we go. So I'm going to take and lasso this out. Make sure I got the piece. I can narrow this down. And what I've done is, uh, if you're unfamiliar, it's just control clicking around holding alt if the lasso turns red uh, then it's actually working in the negative and the green would be to show the selection that you have so I'm just gonna lock this off here hey what's up welcome hello guten tag wie geht es Ihnen konnichiwa Bienvenidos. <laughs> All right, so let me see here. Sorry, took care. I hope uh, all are having an excellent uh, Easter weekend, spring break, and all. Got chunked off a little bit too much. So, okay, right about here is cool. I could probably just take these groups and lock these off by hiding and selecting. Sorry, because of the fact that the mesh is pretty dense, sometimes selecting these with the lasso is not the most feasible. But uh, one of the mistakes that I made is when I auto grouped some of these parts, there were a few sections in which. Uh, the groups came out different even though the pieces looked the same. Uh, so probably if you did something like going into the deformation tab and actually smoothing by groups, it might make the shapes a little bit more similar. Uh, it was kind of a weird reaction, but like I got all of my auto groups, but even within similar shapes, uh, still happened to mix them up into different shapes. So it auto grouped it, but it didn't auto group it the way that I was hoping <laughs> but easy fixes there we go so pretty much I've got one side of this so I'm just gonna go in and kill symmetry and nix one half of it which I believe will be on the other side of the X axis there I'm going to grab uh, lasso and just mix this down, get rid of any stray pieces of uh, poly that is around. Uh, so anyway, now that I, yeah, totally right. So now that uh, I've got most of this piece, I can kind of clean up some of the edges.
I have a little bit of overage. It's up to you. Kind of an optional deal there. But that looks clean enough. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is actually do a split hidden from this. So everything that we've hidden out, uh, I'm just going to basically pull it right out. So, uh, oh dear. For some reason my configuration got messed up. Well, I had a bunch of items saved here. Hot darn. Okay. So, let's just do this. Basically what you want to do is go to your split and split hidden. Which will tear that piece off and turn it into a new subtool. And so now that I have this, uh, there's a few things that I want to do. So I'm going to keep some of the sharp edges. So there's a lot of nice little cuts in here. I'd like to keep some of those contours. So what I'm going to actually do is just uh, do like a, a group loops on it, which will go around the outside edge. So edge loop. You know what? This is really crazy. I don't know what happened to my... I think I started ZBrush back up and it didn't load my UI. It's crazy. You know what? Never mind. I don't want to mess around with it. Take up too much time. So group loops, uh, you know, you can choose how many loops, um, and then you can set the polish to whatever you want, but I'm just going to do one simple group loop around the edge, and then that should maintain the sharpness of the edges. So now what I want to do is actually Z-remesh it. So I'm going to try to kick down some of the dense nature of this uh, by seeing if I can get away with um, Z-remeshing. So can keep that kind of simple. So let's see. Uh, I don't really need to freeze any border or group. Uh, I can set my adaptive. I'm going to actually crank this up a little bit. I think probably 75 might do it. Uh, and I'm going to set a poly count to 0 0.5 maybe. And then I'm going to use that as a starting point and I can reset it and try to Z-remesh it and see if it'll hold the shape. So Z-remesh it. Sorry, this part actually sometimes takes a little, takes a second to get get done. But depending on the speed of your machine, I suppose, or uh, amount of memory, this might be a little bit faster. But it's running an algorithm, and it probably with ZBrush, uh, when it's doing its thing, it's probably best not to touch it. So I'm not, I'm gonna leave the interface alone a little bit until I know that it's absolutely done running. So there we go. So at least that's a little bit more manageable. And, yep, the shaping looks pretty decent. So now what I want to do is actually, um, I'm going to actually just unkink this a little bit. So maybe, uh, oops, go back up here, here. And I'm actually going to just do a slight polish by groups, maybe two. Softens it out just a tad, especially around the edges. And then, now, I'm going to go back up, go into the edge loop menu, there we go, and I'm going to set some things for panel looping. So to give this some thickness, you know, usually you could do something like a Q mesh, but this is so dense, I just want to grab the absolute edge. So I'm going to go ahead and set a few things for panel looping. So it's clicked on double, uh, double is checked on one loop, I'm going to give it no polish, no bevel. And for an elevation, this is usually by default 100, but I'm going to go negative 100 so that way that my extruded piece of uh, thickness will go from this side downward. Uh, and then as far as thickness goes, I'm going to get something moderate, like about uh, 0 0.035 maybe. Uh, and panel loop it. And so that gives me an edge, right? And so now that I have an edge, uh, there's a couple of different things that I can do, so I'm actually going to hit Z Modeler Brush, but I am going to Control Shift if you're using a PC. I think it's probably about the same for Mac. Uh, click and hide the front and back piece, or front and back face, excuse me. There we go. And just getting the edge, I'm going to go over to deform, uh, Deformation again do uh, polish by groups, which kind of just soften up some of the 
you know, parts where some of these uh, loops are a little hard or jagged, kind of unkinks it a little bit. I keep it at a low setting so I don't change the shape too much. Uh, and then under your crease menu, uh, you can take your crease and maybe set it. So I'm going to soften it up just a little bit. So maybe 60 for the crease level instead of 15, which is its default. I want to go a little softer, so I'm going to go like 3. And then I'm going to crease PG, which is polygroup. Right? So that way, if I check my dynamic subdivision, uh, let me show you that. Dynamic subdiv, and you look at it, uh, if I hit D, always yes. Now I've got a piece that's fairly decent to look at. And I can sculpt this up. Uh, the way that I want and just use the move tool to pair a lot of plates. Do I ever use the polish features? Yes! Uh, in fact, a lot of times um, using Dynamesh, I use Dynamesh with polish turned on, especially for, for hard surface. Something like this is neat because, um, you know, in the, the concept sketch, I can still sort of make out some of the landmarks of uh, what I hard sculpted into the sketch. Uh, and then I can, you know, sort of clip these things out. There's another also way that I want to show you guys, um, and I'm actually not going to do it on this model. I'm going to just use like some simple geo to do it. But there's a couple of cool ways that you can do some contouring and surfacing uh, similar to this. So in other words, basically what I did was I masked out an area, right, to create a, a hard surface piece, uh, and then basically off of that piece I group looped it. Uh, and then I ran Z remesher on it, to un, you know, to get some cleaner topology on it. Uh, and then I used uh, panel looping to make sort of a, an extrude. And so, like now, even coming out of, uh, if I shift D and back to its regular state there, shift F back to polyframes, I could still, you know, manipulate the thickness or uh, what have you by if I use the move tool, say for example, uh, and I control click on this area, it will mask off all the other areas or polygroups so the purple and the actual aqua color outer shell can stay in place and I can pull and use the gizmo to just give it a little bit more thickness or adjust its thickness a little bit more. So I mean that's that's kind of a, a cool advantage um, to doing something like this. And then you know uh, I will detail uh, this piece up by just you know if I check its subdivisions by hitting D on the keyboard and going into dynamic subdivision to look at the piece, uh, I can see how it smooths out. Uh, sort of similar to if you use a different package turbo smoothing, um, you know, like in Max or Maya. Um, so yes, I do use some polish features. Uh, you have a cheap walk on with 1024 pressure level, is a good idea to upgrade to a higher pressure level? Tablet. Um, you know what? One time I made the mistake of using a, a bamboo uh, stylus. I actually bought it by accident and thought maybe, you know, I didn't really, I wasn't knowledgeable at the time of the different pressure levels. But once I got on an Intuos, I think probably I really, could, you know, I was really starting to cook with fire. So uh, probably, you know, like Intuos Pro M medium is, is probably like a, a good standard to start off with. Uh, yep, yep. Practice makes perfect. It does indeed. I have one question. Uh, I answered that one. Uh, yes, pressure levels does make a lot of difference, especially when sculpting. Uh, strangely enough, I myself I use uh, a Cintiq Twenty One UX from a few years ago, uh, and I also use an Intuos Pro M. And for sculpting, a lot of times, uh, more times than not, actually, I actually rather. I'm a little bit more tactile when I use it uh, on a flat surface instead of looking at the screen and sculpting. So I don't use my Cintiq very often for uh, sculpting. It's a shame, actually. <laughs> but I do use it for illustration, which is great. Uh, because you know I draw and paint a lot um, amongst a, a host of other things, even doing some vector stuff. So anyway, uh, let's see. So now if I wanted to get all of the subdivision levels out of this that I wanted to, uh, let's go back. Sorry, I'm going to collapse a few of these so I don't get confused. Uh, there we go, there we go. And sorry, so mono, uh, dynamic subdivision. And so right now it's dividing it by two, which actually is probably about a level three. 
because it's always one one more up. If I wanted to get some more detail out of this, I could crank it up a little bit, you know, uh, and then have a look and see how it, it is. You know, uh, if I wanted more close-up details, I can, you know, crank up the subdivision and get a lot more resolution out of the mesh. So probably five to start off with. I think I can do that. And that's how it divides. So now, you know, I start doing a lot of detailing. So in other words, classic brushes like a polish brush. Uh, and I even use a couple of oldies but goodies. Like uh, if you guys have, I've mentioned his name before. Uh, I forget his actual full name, so you'll have to excuse me. But on GBC, he's known as Molochus the Black. Uh, created some great brushes that are still, I believe, archived if you do a search for them on ZBC, but uh, I used some of his uh, mock cut brushes and also uh, polish brushes. So great kind of alternatives to just like an art, hard polish or a soft polish, um, but gets, you know, some nice angled flat cuts out of it, sharpens it up so I can keep on surfacing this out. And every once in a while if I get some dips, uh, what I do is I use BH and the H polish of course is always you know like it when it pushes into a, ma uh, a mesh and you get like sort of a dimple you can always hold alt and reverse the direction of the brush uh, and harden it back up or fill that that dimple so that you don't uh, you can go back over it normally and sort of you know fix it to where you can kind of unkink it a little bit flatten it back out. Sorry, sorry. So there we go. Then I just use a little bit of smoothing uh, to flatten it. And I'll do the same over here. start doing some um, other things like shaping up uh, some of the edges by if I wanted to go over here and use like the clip curve and I suppose I like working this because even if I Z remesh this or something like that essentially what the clip curve does as uh, I hope most everyone knows is it flattens geometry it doesn't really like trim it or clip it off so if you look at it and then look at the geo you can see that it just really smushed it into shape and flattened it. But the, the, ge the geo is still there, it's still existing. Maybe around this edge there might be some stuff that's folded, uh, which I could probably try to relax a little bit and reshape, making sure, it, like if, even if I was to see mesh, I could probably frame the mesh uh, based on polygroup and then run another z remesher and keep everything pretty straight to how it is. Right? So, it really is sort of a matter where uh, topology doesn't matter as much uh, so that you can you know quickly sort of uh, make difficult shapes uh, and or investigate your own shape language so that's a lot of what I like to do so I'm gonna go ahead and try something else got this great uh, uh, brush that I would like to use there's a couple of alphas that I could stamp into here let me do this first. I'm going to draw in some cut lines using one of Molochus's brushes. And it's a nice uh, lazy mouse set brush, but it's more of like a, a bevel shape. And I can kind of come through and just, you know, even with this amount of geo, do a fair amount of detail. Right, so now I'm just using like um, alpha shapes. To create some surface noise. And I can also divisionally kind of chunk up uh, sections using a brush like this. So, um, you know, forms that are major forms and then uh, secondary forms, tertiary forms, uh, are sort of like a way of thinking that I try to approach things. Maybe in three stages, you know. There we go. 
go. So I can play with something like that. And then let's try to change something. I'll use uh, another stamp here with drag rectangle. And digging into the mesh, I'll just kind of try out some design on one piece. There, 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 and here. Trying to be sparse with this. Okay, so then add, you know, as I add up pieces like this, uh, and I go back and turn most of everything else on. turn this guy on. So basically this is what happened. So from this rough uh, I just refined one sectional piece and then when I build another piece uh, and I can always mirror and weld this. So in other words even though this side is this way I actually forgot to do it before I subdivided and started dividing this up but uh, you can basically take a piece like this um, and kick it to the other side by doing a mirror and weld. I would do that early on. Uh, sometimes I always forget about this and then I have to go back and fix it, but uh, you can freeze subdivision levels and then kick it back to the other side, or you could kill the lower uh, subdivision levels, uh, like I'm about to do, uh, and then just uh, reconstruct subdivision levels, and it should kick it down to a fairly good amount of its topology from what it was. So basically what you have to do is delete lower, and then take something like this, uh, and do modify topology, mirror and weld. And so it made it on the other side. The only way it's showing kind of weird is uh, the concept mesh is kind of uh, peeking through the geometry, but it's actually there. And like that. And then basically I just go through and reconstruct subdivision. And it'll try to recreate my subdivision steps going backwards. So it gets lower and lower. And every once in a while on the inside, it, nothing really matters on the inside because not really, you're not really going to see it, but uh, you can tell a couple of spots maybe uh, under normal circumstances that would probably have done uh, back face masking. Uh, which to show is basically if you go with the brush, um, oops, grab this guy, there we go. Uh, with the brush, a lot of times uh, I will go into auto masking and do back face masking. That way, when you use a brush, uh, kind of in the way that I did at its highest re resolution, uh, it doesn't peek through the back. It only makes a, an impression on the front side of the faces. So, like, let's say I want a new detail uh, and I'll do it along the X, actually X being uh, from transform, you might want to check your transform and make sure that you're using active symmetry. Uh, and then I can take back face masking on and I can use a detail without, right? And you see nothing on the other side on the inside set of faces, but if I was to turn this off and try to use it again, there's a po very strong possibility that it would probably show through on the other side. So if you don't want any de kind of details on the inside faces, even if nobody's going to see it or not, uh, you might want to try that option uh, for those that are probably beginners. Do I print a lot of my sculptures? I've printed a few. Uh, I've had the opportunity of having a few printed out. Um, and it's always a neat process. I, it's something that I want to get into as, as soon as I'm I, like really kind of in the market for a 3D printer. So something hopefully soon that I'll be able to do. But yeah, I mean, it's I, I do a lot of kit bashing actually with real models, um, and just by mixture of uh, like different materials, recycled materials. Uh, but I've been actually thinking about 
uh, possibly using uh, 3D printed sculpts along with Kitbash. So sort of mixing up a random uh, uh, world of the two. Uh, so I think it would be kind of something neat to really try and explore. Yes, you can also outsource. There's a lot, pl plenty of sor uh, sources for that. Um, if you probably Google it, but there are companies where you can upload your files and then have them printed out by someone, and they can send you a prototype. So it's just like a prototyping service. Mm. Yeah, Cintiqs are really cool. Sorry, I didn't answer that one before, I mean, but yeah. They, they work pretty good. Sometimes uh, some of the older models used to get a little slightly warm, but I'm sure they've gotten much better. So I'm just going to clip off a little section here. There we go. So that's a little bit cleaner. Uh, and then I can smooth out this edge a little bit. But probably because I'm going to pull this in between different plates, that kind of detail is probably not going to matter as much. So I'm just going around and just doing a little general smoothing in a few flat spots. But yeah, you, know, you can keep detailing something like this, uh, add different alpha shapes. And now that I've done that reconstruction, I think I had like five levels. As I move backwards, back down, uh, I still have a lot of the same type of geometry that I had in the first place coming out of, uh, uh, coming out of uh, Z Remesher. Yeah. Save! Don't forget to save. Anybody else have any questions about what I'm doing? Uh, because if so, if not, I'm, that is pretty much how I surfaced most of this. So uh, I'm going to turn this off, turn a few of these other pieces on, and sort of show you some of the surfaces that were built up to this point. So starting at the faceplate, click some of these on. out of solo might help and so basically for each panel and plate uh, in the instance of something like this I plated it out uh, and then added extra details so uh, curiously enough like um, if you ever let's go back to our, our piece up top and I'll show dynamic um, before you guys get started with uh, doing any of the paneling um, Sometimes you might want to add different details actually in the geometry. And so because all of this uh, topology has been sort of worked out uh, via Z Remesher, and sometimes you might even get it lower, or you might use uh, Z Remesher guides to get sort of the edge flow that you want, um, you can always take and edit any of these or add in extra information by way of using the Z Modeler brush, uh, which is kind of cool. Like, say, if you wanted to put in extra creasing in certain areas, um, those will work. Also, if you take plates, uh, like let's say for example, I'm going to go onto a face uh, and do a Q mesh, and a single poly. So that means that, oops, sorry, I need to do one thing. I'm going to duplicate this actually. Work on a duplicate. Uh, that way, I need to work on it with no subdivision levels. So I'm going to delete higher and just do something here. So uh, I can go and select uh, faces, do things like extrudes or add extra shapes. So I'll go this way, uh, maybe here and here. that guy. And so all of these gray areas are the single um, poly selections that I'm doing with the, the Z modeler. And I would do something like um, a Q mesh with maybe like a tenth or quarter step. And then I can pull that right out. All right. So when I use the dynamic subdivision, I can see how it smooths out and what kind of detail starts to form as I um, do subdivision. And you can even edit this way when things are smooth. So like, let's say for example, with Q mesh, you can always sort of bridge pieces, especially at an angle. So you can always create details where you do Alt, grab some faces here, 
and depending on the setting, like if I go as finite as a tenth step, this time when I Q mesh this, you might see where it starts to snap, and I can even, within a few ticks, create an angle. And that's how you can add little small points. Um, even things like uh, in the panel, if you wanted to create something like a, what I call a poor man's panel loop, but it's not actually poor at all, it's just the way that geometry works, right? So you could do an insert, just insert a few edges here. And then on the face, I'm just gonna show this outer edge face, if I can. There we go. Uh, and then with something like this, I can use visibility. Uh, and then just shrink the visibility. So in other words, uh, I think it's, is it Control Shift X or Control X, I believe is the shortcut key for it. But I can shrink it, polygroup this, and then showing back all the piece. I can take a, a strip, like a poly strip or loop, Qmesh, uh, and then what I would do is uh, probably full step and poly loop. And I'll just push inward. Whoops, sorry. There we go. Push inward, or you could push outward. And it's the same as like almost like a bevel profile. Because when you subdivide it, it has a nice little lip around the side. And I'll frame it. And that way you can get sort of an edge, like if you're putting two plates together, um, one could go in and one could go out and they could interlock or something like that. Oh yes, it probably was. I just wasn't paying attention by that. <laughs> Sometimes I'm so bad at really uh, hot cut uh, hot hot keys or short, shortcut keys. Uh, some of them I actually I, I've never like committed to memory even, but I just go through the pains of going through the menus and stuff like that. And some of my some of the basic more basic ones I actually remember a lot or try to re try to remember. But uh, something like this is what how you can use the Z modeler to refine some of your pieces or add details. That's basically what I was trying to show you. So hitting D, you know, for dynamic subdiv, you can see your um, subdivision levels in advance, so off of the geometry, the smooth subdivision, these are always the steps that you can take, so uh, one going on up, probably, just remember every time you set this, it's, gonna, it's actually going to be plus one to that level, so if I have four, then it's going to give me five when I apply it, right? Here, let me zoom in here, dynamic subdiv, this is on, here's the apply button, and here are your preview levels, right? So, if you haven't ever messed with that, it's probably something good to show. And shift F to come out of the polyframe again, and I could probably just use some hardening, um, maybe some alphas to change some of the uh, shape of this, and, you know, have a go at it. All right. So moving right along, I kicked everything over uh, once shown, over to Keyshot. And so I just want to show you how that kind of came up together. So uh, once in ZBrush, uh, one of the things to use Keyshot if you're using the bridge is to grab, uh, I believe the, sorry, just had a brain fart there. Anyway. Uh, you want to grab your render tab. Sorry. And so I'll dock it. For some reason, I when I restarted ZBrush, it didn't load my UI, so I'm put off a little bit. But sorry about that. Uh, just bear with me. Render. External render. And you want to select Keyshot. And I'm doing an auto merge. Um, and I hit BPR, and it sends it over to Keyshot, which I still have open from the project. And I've already gone ahead and put a few materials on this uh, and set up a few cameras. But I'm going to go to my free camera and just turn this around and show you guys how it looks. So I'm using 80% of my CPU, uh, about 7 cores, to render this um, on a 970, so not so bad. Um, and I've actually managed to create some materials uh, just using like the curvature map. So, if 
you look at something like this, all of these materials it did sort of a polyfill with basic colors in ZBrush. Um, and then when I used the bridge and shot it over using BPR, I started assigning some materials to certain items, uh, which you can start by using scene here, right? So if I click on some of these, they might highlight out of the list. There we go. Uh, and then it's taking its time to actually render each time because it's a real-time render. So bear with me if some of the areas look a little pixelated, if those of you who are not very familiar. But uh, I just took like a, a couple of basic uh, materials like plastics uh, and metals and put them on here uh, and then set up something of a uh, uh, a material using the material graft. Let's see here. I'll show you what this looks like. Material graft in here. I'll pull it on screen. So to get some of the cavities to have sort of a, a curvature, I off of the label sections have a metal or two different metals set up, and then one has a, a curvature map applied to it, and the other actually has scratches. Uh, and then this I believe because I used alt uh, and click and drag of the material onto uh, this model uh, the base of it is actually the material is actually paint but it actually links in uh, whatever material uh, was their original material on there so it's combining whatever got sent from ZBrush uh, along with the poly paint and adding its key shot material when you, especially when you take and uh, Let's look at a material list, for example. You take something and you actually hold Alt, and you see a plus mark on the arrow, and you click and drag over. It actually mixes the color of the material, the vertex paint, uh, and the material itself on the object, right? Did you want to look at lighting? Uh, interestingly enough, um, there's, o there's only a few areas that are actually lit with any type of area lighting, but um, as I might have mentioned, uh, here, I'll show you my lighting setup. So, uh, I have used the HDRI editor, uh, and I've set up only about three different pins just so I could sort of uh, get some more, I guess, global uh, light out of sort of like the skyline. I took this actual HDRI myself um, in downtown LA uh, using a Samsung Gear 360 camera that I got. It's my Note 8. Uh, and it really works pretty well for lighting in a lot of instances. It's really totally easy to make HDRIs these days, so that's something to consider. But I set up about three pins, and then one sort of like bluish light I made a little bit more intense, uh, but this is kind of how it's set up. Uh, fall off maybe in and around 1.2 or so, uh, and then I think there's some other cutoff values. But if I was to take and hide some of this geo, which is probably what I should do, Let's see if I hide the visor, not that. Let's click this one. There we go. I hide this guy. We can take a look, sort of what's going on underneath uh, the visor. So I set up lights in sort of some of these empty areas that I had, uh, and use them as sort of like a design element. So basically, what I did was in ZBrush, there's actual geometry behind these objects, and then in the materials themselves. Uh, a lot of times I will use the lumen materials, so L-U-M-E-N, uh, and then use like lumen cools uh, or lumen warms, whatever the base is, and plop it right in there. Oops, sorry, actually this camera has uh, depth of field on, so take that off. That way we can see a little bit more clearly. But this is a lumen, this is a, I believe a white lumen, and then the same material was copied over here, uh, and I set I unlinked them and then uh, set different values so that the shapes didn't get lost within each other. So if like the ring is too bright, then the dot itself won't be as visible. So I think it's like maybe the inside is 60 and the outside is like maybe 120 and then this is something like 160. And then the light that you get cast around the objects in here uh, will also probably generate it on the inside of the visor. And so it sort of starts to mix a little bit. Uh, but the blue tint of it actually keeps the shape and so you could just kind of get some internal mixes of different reflections which is kind of fun. Um, a lot of times what I'll do is when I'm rendering something like this I'll actually add uh, 
like a capsule shape uh, and then use that as a, a different light source uh, so that way I can get sort of a, ha have a piece of geometry that I can put an aerial light on and then I can move it around inside of Keyshot and get maybe a better lighting scenario and then do a render um, and then also uh, probably as I set this up for you guys I'm not going to try to render this uh, inside of the stream because it takes too long and I don't want to use up uh, too much of our time today but uh, once I render it what I'm going to try to do is use a couple of different material passes so maybe one uh, you know white material that will be like an AO pass on a few different levels uh, oh thank you cheers Pedro thank you but um, yeah after I get all of the materials and all of the shaping up I think a uh, one interesting thing that's coming up with this, as I'm going to try to sculpt out more of it, is there's a few fabric bits here, which I'm probably going to try, maybe make an attempt at doing in um, Marvelous Designer. And so I'll show you how that works, uh, because you know basically I could just make these shapes and then inflate it and put it around here, and then carry over some of these details uh, later with other bits of geometry, sort of uh, sculpt out some of the wrinkles. But I'll, I'll actually probably get more of a, a shrink-wrapped kind of nice little texture going uh, if I do it in Marvelous uh, versus any place else. I mean, I suppose if you don't have Marvelous, if you're more familiar with Maya or Max, you know, there's there's decent cloth sims that are in there. But uh, I think Marvelous is probably becoming a, a popular standard for something like that. But, you know, you could start building clothing, uh, maybe a hood or something like that. And, and it would probably lend nicely to some of the forms. So sort of the purpose behind building a visor over this is basically to have one swooped form as a major silhouette and then you know additive, additive to that silhouette but sort of transparent so that it doesn't detract from the, the overall form but you know sort of accents it uh, along with the eyes and it gives it sort of a nice uh, area of focal detail uh, as a character even though hard surface you know uh, hard surface characters can't emit emotion very well uh, or if you know you have to use certain devices to do something like that like uh, you know the color of the eyes or maybe slight movement or gesture uh, but as a static face you know to give it that sort of extra punch or impact I thought it would be cool to do sort of a, a caustic uh, material so this if you look at it is actually um, the glass window energy it's a default that's in here but I've kind of tweaked some of the color uh, but pretty much the refractive index, uh, I think I've left the same. Uh, with, with using glass to get more detail out of it, one thing I might mention is also in lighting. Uh, you might want to adjust your shadow quality and also the ray bounces here. I noticed that generally a lot of times when I'm developing stuff, uh, some of the ray bounces I've left generally low, like uh, three or six ray bounces, so that way it, it renders a little bit faster. But if you're doing something with, like, say, glass, for example, uh, 12 uh, seems to do a lot better with some of the more fractal qualities or the lighting of the glass. Uh, and if you have cut lines in this, some of the details actually get a little bit sharper when you have more ray bounces. So um, it's basically just where the, the light is hitting the, the poly faces uh, and rendering it out each, with each pass. So with 12 passes, it gets a lot cleaner. So, but you can change the tint and do some really cool stuff. Um, kind of makes me reminiscent of uh, a lot of the Tron Legacy kind of uh, design feel. Uh, Neville Page and David Levy and those guys were doing really cool stuff with like transparent and neon sort of uh, high cyan color uh, objects. So really cool. Anyway, uh, so a lot of this with curvature. So just again, I'm just gonna show this map uh, and if you wanted to check it I'll leave it up for a second but basically this is the ZBrush default material this is the base of the paint and in the label I have two different metals I think this is just a standard metal you can click on these and adjust different properties for each specific one uh, and I believe I forgot the shortcut but I think it's between C and X yeah C and A you could preview the color so if, like, if you go onto the node and you wanted to preview how your curvature looks on the actual model, you could hit uh, C, and for that specific part, it'll show you what the curvature looks like previewed on the, the actual render. 
but if you double click on them you can actually edit one specific uh, material property right so you know it's it's not the most complicated node system but sometimes it can get confusing um, and I'll, I'll have to actually show you how to make a multi-material which is also capable uh, I think I only tried to use one uh, and fix some of this material where it actually has a secondary material built in it might be actually this one I believe ah uh, yes so here's an example where I'm using a paint uh, base and then another plastic set on top of that and I'm using that for the diffuse change in color uh, and it's probably hooked into yep yeah, about the same similar but I don't get as much curvature material out of it. And I, can, I suppose I could probably plug this in and use, start using it uh, in its color slot. Maybe exchange this for this, for example. Right. Cool. Did anybody have any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to go back to ZBrush. So in the future, actually, I'm going to probably post and do a render of this uh, getting closer to surfacing this uh, probably in sort of the next mode um, besides plucking stuff out in that fashion using panel looping and masking and polygrouping polygrouping is a start usually it's masking polygrouping and then from that polygroup you panel loop it and then from that panel looped object you get some thickness and then you can manipulate it as a shape right uh, another way of doing that I probably was doing a using the uh, topple brush which I only use in a few instances I believe for small tiny pieces uh, but let's uh, get back on track with some of these shapes turn this back off all right and going down the list I start from the bottom up it's an easy way to go turning pieces on leave this guy off so I can make sure everything under it is turned on. I think this is the part of the concept mesh that I'm using to actually really chop things up. And so you can see how I've progressed steadily down uh, the back. There's a couple of other smaller pieces of trim uh, parts that I'm actually going to uh, put, you know, put into actual geo. So let's go back up. And it gets to be really, really fun. Uh, I think probably this piece here is just a detail piece. I'm going to probably make something as a sort of inset back piece to that that will float on the inside, uh, but be a little bit flush to the edge uh, because it's sort of like an inset piece of geometry and that I didn't close off. So make sure we have everything turned back on that we need. There we go. That's most of it. Oh, one more last tail piece there. Oh, this guy. Yep, okay. So with each of these, you know, a lot of these um, plates, sometimes if you see them kind of overlapping the concept, what I, a lot of times what I'm going to do is I'm going to move them out or kind of smash them so that I can complete one edge. And then sometimes I can always sculpt up um, around the border of certain shapes, so be between the, the concept mesh. Uh, so that makes that way, you know, I can create or try to recreate a shape that is exactly going to fit in a spot. And then you think of it as like sort of a puzzle, uh, like an assembly puzzle, where you're going to add in uh, one plate and then another plate, pair it, and if the retopology doesn't exactly match the shape, then you have to subdivide and sort of pull those together. So a lot of times using, under the brush menu, I use the move, but also move topological sometimes also helps. Um, which actually just selects one specific uh, topology or uh, polygroup, excuse me, so that you can move it. But generally, a lot of these are just paired by using a little bit of pinch and a little bit of move uh, to pair them into place. Uh, some I made a little bit more interlocking, so there's an extra edge to it. Hey, thank you, man. Cheers. What's up, Denny? So. Uh, I think it also there's a few missing bits that need yet to be turned on at the bottom. There we go. So in one area, I actually did use a Z-sphere uh, to recreate some topology. 
uh, and I just I will cover it really quickly but just um, you can see here if I show edit let me get the adaptive skin out and the topology uh, if I hit edit topology these were the points to make sort of like the chin shape and this here's sort of like an interesting difference in between doing something like what I was plucking shapes out and actually rebuilding a piece of topology so a lot of these edge flows are a little bit more decided especially when you use the topology tools within ZBrush uh, and so probably some of the flow might be a little bit better uh, and I can get more out of it by using creasing to you know create an absolute hard edge and so with that uh, I can preview it by hitting A shift F and I can actually view and edit the polys um, but basically what you're gonna do is create something like that and under while it's previewed make an adaptive skin uh, which you can append back to your project um, from the tool menu uh, sub tools and append and you can place it back so once I did that that became this piece to which uh, I've just used uh, dynamic subdivision to check some of the subdivision levels um, and then do this there we go uh, and then uh, a lot of these more finite details are actually just alphas right so with these double thick lines you can tell where the creasing is and this is how I'm sort of thinking of uh, a lot of the surfacing um, if I don't connect sort of the lateral uh, edge loop these won't be too hard and a lot of these shapes will actually smooth out and create uh, nice interesting contours for me to use right so what I'm trying to do is actually think ahead uh, in the subdivision game and actually apply a lot of creasing to sort of create like a nice edge flow or directional flow for an object right and once I do that uh, and sort of lock those shapes in then I subdivide it and I can get some very high poly detail which I use an alpha shape right so this one in the same way I gave it thickness uh, you can always set thickness uh, when you do an adaptive skin uh, somewhere in between the same as what I was using for panel looping but I just gave it some back faces so if I, in the end I'm not gonna actually use any of the back faces I may delete them uh, and create like one shell or something which is called a manifold mesh which is an entire mesh that covers the entire topology of the object but for now I'm plating it out so that I can refine specific areas of the model uh, it's a little slower of a development generally you would think you would model something and then you would create correct topology right from go uh, but in this case I'm, I'm actually doing this so that I can go through the motions as a designer to refine each piece uh, specifically to something that I want and I can use several different modes of, of doing that the cool thing is uh, now that we're in 2018 a lot of this stuff um, to really quick sculpt it as a, in a concept phase I can even get more finite now that we have tessellation which is an awesome thing that I'll be talking about in the future I'm still actually catching up to everything that's in the 2018 release but cool cool so that was one piece that was created uh, using a pinned method and sometimes it's cleaner so I'm gonna come out of this come out of solo and so yes I've just paired uh, Sometimes you might get some holes, and I'll just use the move tool to sort of, you know, pull things together. And then next time I start retopologizing, I'll actually do a shape that's a little bit closer of a fit, uh, and then I'll pair the two together. All right? So it kind of works like um, you can even recycle some of this uh, Z sphere stuff. So in other words, instead of appending a Z sphere every time for everything, once you've got a final piece, you can always come back to adaptive skin. Come back to topology, uh, selecting the subtool, of course. There we go. Come out of preview, and I will delete topo. So now, even though it's, it says edit, I can hit Q and keep going and uh, recycle it for some other area. Right? It's still an active Z sphere. So and uh, maybe some other parts and with topology it's always cool to work in a large chunk so I'm going to hold control and start from this vertice 
close it, click it again, uh, maybe add a loop here, add a loop here, come around this way to about here, and of course if you want to fix any of these areas, like say if this is too far out, you can hit W and use the same type of move tool to move around your vertices just like you would in a poly editor, right? want to get like very hardcore with directing my edge flow uh, that's what I'm gonna do so I'll click here and close that off clicking here and clicking here so you saw that gray point there that's at the same uh, flow of the edge loop and it just snaps into the middle uh, probably three-quarter ticks I believe is how it goes but Let's see, click here, click here, click here, here, and here. Maybe later I might have to fix some area down there, but I'm trying to work uh, a little large. Oops. There we go. And then I'll make a shape that goes around there. And if you preview it, of course, you can actually see your poly faces, right? And it already has the same thickness applied to it. Uh, the thickness being negative 0 0.035, which is about the same that which I had set for a lot of the other panel looped, uh, spots. So, it's never fun to look at somebody doing some retopology. It's, it's always a <laughs> laborious task. I mean, it's, it's, some people will get into it. I mean, I, I, I suppose one should have their own sort of sense of zen with doing uh, topology. But it's not always a necessary worry. You know, sometimes you just need it just to get a simple piece of what you're doing. Oop, sorry. There we go. So I'm going to click here and click here. Still trying to keep this a little loose. Oh, there we go. Almost out. Oops. There we go. My voice reminds you of an Eminem song. That's awesome. Wait, what song? What song is it? I'm, I'm just curious. Please don't say Slim Shady. I would hate to be a Slim Shady. Alright. So with this, I'm just going to actually poke the face, basically. And create a center point. But what I'm trying to do is just leave all of these faces in a complete quad. And a lot of times, even if you don't draw the faces, if you preview it, you leave an empty, an empty section, you'll notice, here I'll turn on the transparent. So with this you can see the actual geometry th uh, shine through uh, because I have transparency on. Uh, but if even sometimes when you don't, uh, if most of your geometry is correct uh, in edge flow and it connects as a, you know, good solid quads, uh, even if you don't finish off some edge loops, it will actually automatically complete it for you. So. If you're working fast and dirty, sometimes you can get away with not closing every edge loop. Uh, usually I just do it because uh, I use this kind of topology, especially with smaller parts, uh, where I don't intend to put too much attention into one particular part for too long. Uh, there we go. That's kind of a weird poly, but we'll try it. One, two, three, four. So four faces. Let's see how that works out. It actually holds. Look at that. Okay. So I can take this piece and uh, I'll just uh, make an adaptive skin. Come out of that. Don't edit it. And from
from the C sphere. I go to the absolute bottom, do an append, grab the new stuff, put it in, and solo it. And so now, of course, when I made that, that uh, geo, it was generous enough to give me um, crease points on the inside or the, the lip of the actual object. So now it's just up for me to keep some other elements kind of like a hard shape. So I'm going to hit B, Z with the Z modeler tool. And on the edges, I'm actually going to hit crease uh, and maybe start with doing an edge loop partial. I'm going to come in here and just click up some edges. There we go. There we go. I'm going to go edge, single edge for this part here. And I could just kind of come around the object. Oops. Let's do nothing for that face. And for that, let's do nothing. So that way, if I click off, I don't make any mistakes. There we go. Tap in there. I'll do an edge loop complete for here, which I'll go all the way around. So every once in a while it doesn't. So I'm actually gonna just go around by hand and make sure with a partial. That way it only goes a few steps. So now I can hit D and see how it's shaping up with dynamic subdivision. So I know there's probably a couple of corners that I want, and even in this mode, I can come and hit the Z modeler, still with the crease, just get an edge, single edge go around and tap around the object and harden up some of its corners. That way we get a little bit of a better fit with some of the rest of the other plates that we've built. Uh, and I can sort of control the shaping of this object, right? So dynamic, I'm going to change up a little bit, get it absolutely smooth. And so basically this is sort of the, the crux of getting a nice hard shape out of uh, what I'm doing. go. And with that kind of resolution I could probably uh, come out of here and look at it. So maybe a little bit hard here but I can smooth that out. It won't matter finally. Uh, go transparent and because I don't have the actual concept mesh hidden it's kind of poking through but I can fix that. So let's alt tap on the concept mesh. I'll single it out. Show polygroups. I'll hide that piece. And this piece here. Oops. I get it. There we go. Alright. The rest I can just smash down. So, uh, a lot of times when I'm working on concept meshes and working sort of over them, uh, some weird stuff happens where like they poke through. But generally, I, what I do is I just uh, clip it out or uh, smash it down with like a another brush, like a clay brush or something like that, and then we'd usually take it out. So something like this and that is sort of weird I'm not sure exactly why it put color into it Ooh. there we go I wonder if that's a weird preview thing or maybe something's under there that's actually that color I don't know let's grab this and I'm gonna hit uh, this dynamic silhouette and I'll just get some of these sunken down so that they're not in the way because they really don't matter at this point right and the rest of the edge I'll probably leave because there's a few tiny little bits that I'll leave in for design but uh, and that I'll have to pluck out later. But for this, I'm not 
not sure why that shows up so funky. It's kind of bizarre, but. That is supposed to be my shape. Oh, sorry. I know what that is. That's what that is. Okay. Sorry. It's getting confused again. All right. So now that I have the shape, uh, I want to give it. You know, I've, I think I've given it some some subdivision, but I need to make sure that works. I'm gonna apply it, and now that I've got it applied. Uh, and it's on both sides because I did it in symmetry. What I'll do is I'll just take it and move it around a bit. And sort of pair it up with everything else. Just giving it a tug so I can build around it. Even if I sort of do it a little bit over the area, if I pair it up, I can usually go around the object and just use the clip curve to shape it in. So I'll do something like this. Right? And then again, you can take this and uh, again kick it over to uh, Keyshot by af right after you do like a little bit more refinement. Do they get some weird shaping? I always try to like, you know, subdivide it and see if, if the shapes are a little bit too weird. But once I get to the sort of like a refinement stage where all of this is high poly, uh, it doesn't really matter because what I'm gonna do is once everything is paired up and I think that there's less in the way of holes, even if I create a manifold mesh and then do projection over it, uh, it's not gonna project and go too deep in here and create like some really absolute nastiness. Usually they're they're paired together and then maybe I might do a little smoothing on the edges just to get them sort of like looking like there's a soft, even a soft bevel in between. Uh, but when the baking process happens later, uh, it probably won't matter as much. It'll just all be one mesh with like a, a lot of different surface noise. Some objects I'll actually probably leave as geo, especially if they uh, use light emittance or something like that. And I actually started to color code this out and actually fill the objects with color so that even if I wanted to later, I could possibly use it as uh, like a color map or like a color ID map. And I could probably, you know, go into something like Quixel or Substance and just use that color ID to uh, apply materials to each different spot once I flower it out and UV it, right? So uh, I suppose if I was to delete a lot of the back faces of this, I could actually. UV things by just creating shell or UV shells out of the, the actual polygrouped areas or the chunks. Uh, so, but if I with back faces on it, I really don't want to do UVs on on back faces because it, it would be a waste of map space uh, and resolution, right? So you probably never wanting to do that. But I mean, if I create a manifold mesh that is one mesh and you know contour it pretty well to some of the geometry, and then do a bake uh, based off of that. Uh, working within you know metalness PBR workflow you know you can tailor a lot of um, you know sort of like the wear and tear uh, material breakup and differences um, but it's still, it's still sort of keeping sort of like the same type of color scheme uh, but you can add some sort of real world you know uh, materials as you know but uh, it kind of depends on the in process like if I if I'm just doing a Photoshop illustration of something like this as a static image which pretty much this is uh, I might just go ahead and render it and do a lot of the type of materials or, or material feel that I want to do and explore that in Photoshop. So I wouldn't actually necessarily even poly paint the, that stuff in. I'd just give it a, a sort of basic material look, um, maybe changing some of the material uh, difference inside of Keyshot when I render it. Uh, and then inside of Keyshot I would make a couple of render passes. Um, one with rim light, one within solid AO, which sometimes you don't want to use the AO instead of uh, Keyshot, but maybe you could use a white diffuse material, um, and it sort of get a little bit more richness out of the depth of uh, shadows. Um, and then, you know, once you have that, uh, and I think I've shown you guys some other uh, render techniques uh, previously, like in the Blade Runner project that I was working on a couple of weeks ago, uh, you could take something like that, 
um, and use the geometric normal to flip around a lot of your lighting. So um, you can make several lighting passes and then save it out. Um, and then sometimes you can put objects in for lighting and then also affect a model. And then that way, you know, uh, between what is rendered and what you can actually flip around manually uh, in Photoshop, uh, it can be pretty intensive and you can get some really nice finite kind of details. I also like to paint in textures um, using black and white textures to say like uh, masks. So I get like a nice, you know, stone or like a stone wash material or something like that or something gritty. Uh, and you can con convert it into black and white uh, and then take that and just paste it into your channels so like in an alpha channel um, and depending on how clean that alpha is you can use it as a mask and then you can use that mask to actually paint in sort of things uh, maybe even paint uh, um, what is it adjustment layers uh, onto a surface and give a material a totally different look you can even render out uh, a curvature map for something like this um, you could use a curvature material singular, singularly when you render, uh, and then once you have that curvature pass, you use it as a selection to basically mask out another material render, right? So like, say bright metal would be the edge wear, uh, the curvature is the controlling factor as the mask, and then, you know, you can get, sort of adjust the look of your edge wear on top of the surface. Does that make sense? But as far as like, Stretched polys, uh, it depends. If the polys are stretched when you do some baking, or if the polys are kind of stretched in a non-optimal way when you bake. Uh, if you're using maybe some other things, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if ZBrush has a mode for this, but there are a couple of other things, like if you used Hedis, or if you used Unfold 3D to do a lot of UVing. Um, a lot of those applications, um, in fact, I think it's even, is it Roadkill for Maya maybe? Uh, they have uh, sort of a display where they'll show blue and red areas to sort of show you where uh, the polys are a little bit more optimized than not. Uh, usually, you know, with red you get a little bit more stretching and with blue you get a little bit more compression on the map. And so it really depends on how your map is cut and then relaxed uh, and then pinned and stretched out uh, to get, you know, uh, to lessen the distortion, I suppose. Right? So. Uh, I, you know, a lot of <laughs> contested information, I'm sure, but, you know, it's pretty awesome to kind of learn it and test it out and, and make sure that it's working. But I, I don't get, with something like this, I'm not going to really bake uh, that hardcore into these shapes. This is for, like, just, like, a static uh, sort of deal. And in, because they're solid shapes, I really don't have to worry about UVing. I could just go into Keyshot and dump a material on it with some poly paint. Uh, and then the rest I could probably do in Photoshop. So it's it's not a full bake process. There's probably two different, like I, like I said, two different directions for uh, what outcome you wish to choose, right? All, all paths have a deriving end. So anyway, getting back to things, I hope that answers your question, <laughs> Josh. Uh, I'm going to pull this out a little bit. Pull this down, and then singularly look at this, and maybe do a little bit of smoothing. So, funny enough, with uh, dynamic subdivision, I, I think I mentioned this, but probably some of these are a little bit hard. The edge is a little bit hard, so what I'm going to try to do is maybe knock it down just a little bit with deformation, and so I'll use like a smooth. A low setting, maybe polished by features. Polish crisp edges, there we go. Maybe even just give it a nice little smoothing in some places. I always hate it when I forget to set like the values of creasing because like sometimes you want objects that are not absolutely sharp. You don't want to go through. It's one pass. You want to be able to just change it. But I suppose on the crease menu you could probably change your values and on how smooth you want a particular edge to be. It's almost like uh, smoothing groups and stuff like that. But with uh, 
doing stuff in the geometry for that. Uh, you know, when you add reinforcement loops, you know, the distance in between, like hard edge that you place the, the reinforcement loop, it's going to be either softer or harder. The closer in, it's going to be harder. Uh, the farther out, it's going to be a little bit smoother. Uh, almost like a bevel. Cool, cool. I like to answer questions. Good questions. Okay. So something like this. Actually, that circle looks a bit off. So I'm just going to use a move tool, pull it around a little bit. Yep. Yep. I'll do just a semi lazy fix here. I'm going to use an alpha ring. I got and I pull it in create the same sort of lip and again here's one of those spots where I should have done this uh, brush and auto masking back face mask that way we don't get the nasty back face stuff actually let's try that again oops This guy, bump up the intensity to 19. Come in here and just make a few cut lines. Just a few short interim details, just to make things interesting. There we go. So just as a small part, I'm sure that will work. Here's another ring here. Use one small detail. Here, that should be good. And I can add to that later. But for now, I just want to get it generally looking about the same. So there we go. That looks a little bit cleaner. And what if we even take it and uh, change some of the coloring? So I can do that. So I'm just going to take uh, here on the palette, just sample this white. And do a color fill object. It's OK. Probably need to smash some clay down on the other side here. So I'm going to hit X so I come out of symmetry. Oops. There we go. Oops. There we go. All right, all right. Ah, that's why. You know what? Actually, let's. Uh, Solo that instead of plucking it out that way. I'll just hide it. There we go. And then that way it doesn't overlap so much. So just get rid of it. And then I can just hit BPR again and shoot it back over. Forgot my visor though. Hot damn. Hello, Pixel Desire. Now what it's doing is it's uh, wrapping up all the geometry, sending it over to Keyshot. Derp, 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 derp. And in Keyshot it's being imported and set up. Oh, thank you. Cheers. Yeah, it's been been kind of fun to just sort of work fast on something. It's it's actually. Uh, sometimes when I think of topics to talk about with you guys, I'll, I'll just do like a, a little 
like ZBrush Crunch, so I'll take like two hours and figure out some things. There's a, another uh, model that I have kind of as an extension from what we were working on uh, in last in stream, and um, I'll try to open it and show you kind of what became of things uh, with that one. But it sort of took a, another direction because sometimes I'm, I'm left with the impression that oh, I just can't leave it alone like after stream. So like all week I'll, I'll be fiddling with uh, a few different models, <laughs> you know, just trying to do a lot of different shape building. So pretty much here everything was got except the helmet. So the helmet, the visor helmet that's actually glass, I just gave sort of a generic color and placed it floating over this. Uh, and I may leave it like this, but if I ever needed to actually connect it to the rest of the helmet or add on, you know, tertiary forms, like, uh, I've thought of maybe doing some iterations where I put, like, sort of an earmuff design or, like, uh, rabbit ears or something like that, you can, you know, definitely explore a design direction. And with this, a lot of the topology is still pretty optimal, considerably, you know? Uh, so I can, you know, sort of go down in subdivision levels, um, you can even, um, like say for example, uh, here in the tool palette, if you have an object that has subdivision levels, uh, generally there is a all high and all low uh, feature that you can use so that you can sort of bounce in between high res and low res. Uh, for some strange reason, I don't, I don't see it. Oh yeah, all low, all high, which will kick everything uh, that has subdivision levels quickly back down to its lowest or up to its highest. So you could uh, use stuff like that and sort of keep your, your viewport kind of, you know, fresh. I'm going to kick this one more time, sorry. I know this takes a second, but I forgot the visor part, which I didn't want to do because it had a nice material on it, which I actually think I saved, just in case. Every once in a while, if you get disconnected, like say if you have a uh, but you had sent a project over to Keyshot, not, there are ways to save things and so that you don't have to do all of the materials over again, but generally uh, you have to relink the project again or it'll send it back to its sort of default state again to Keyshot. Right, let's see. It's taking a second. It's checking on it. There we go. Ah, so it did. It actually messed up. But that's okay because I have the material saved. So I'll just do this. Holding Alt, or actually, you know what? Hold Alt, grab it. Oop. Hold it, grab it. Hold Alt, and drag and drop it onto the object. And like new, there it is. All right. So now I would have to t do the same for uh, this object. So I'm just gonna, since it's the co same color scheme as some other elements on the on the helmet. A lot of times when I refine a piece, I'll just take borrow the same, uh, copy the material, and then right click again and paste linked material. So both the two will be linked again and it's on there and it has the same sort of like edge wear and it looks pretty good. have to give it a second to sit and it'll refine its render. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, particularly, as I was as I was mentioning earlier, there's there's not too much that I'm gonna work on with um, doing a lot of the new features yet because I, there's still a couple of areas that I, I want to become a little bit more versed on before I give advice to folks uh, uh, using ZBrush. But here's something that's kind of interesting. I was actually gonna talk just for a second, uh, do something with a sphere just to show you guys. We'll, we'll pluck apart some geometry and sort of uh, see. But with the cool thing with a sphere, starting this as a base, every time you start sculpting, um, you can use something like, like a sphere just, just for contouring alone, right? Sorry, actually, I wanted that. Um, 
So this blue here is the Z forward. I'm going to start pulling out a shape just really quickly. Get a big brush. Oops. Make polymesh 3D. That's important. EM. And if I pull this out, pull it out from the sides. So you can get crazy contoured shapes. And if you're smart about it, you can even sort of design those shapes into something from this kind of base, right? So let's say, for example, I subdivide this a few times, get rid of all of the faceting, and then I start drawing in a mask. So because I'm in sy symmetry, I can get this down, so you all know. Uh, hold control, start drawing or sketching a panel shape, right? Sort of a contour, if you will. seems difficult enough. I'll have the brush size and just fill it. And now because it's a little bit smooth uh, and I want to dial this in, I'll make a small brush size so I can hone it in. But Alt, or excuse me, Control and Alt of course is the negative mask, sort of working like a, as an eraser. And I'll just clean this up. And beyond cleaning up, uh, masking this way of course, you know, Control, Alt, uh, and double tapping on the mask or on the object will actually sharpen the mask. Excuse me. So I'll take a little bit of more alt brush. Holding alt in the mask. Excuse me. So that seems fair enough as a shape. So uh, I can take this and turn it to a polygroup. So in other words, if we look at our polygroups, there's not too much to this. Um, probably it would have been safer for the shape of the topology if I had made this uh, a, a Dynamesh. Um, reason being, uh, I'm worried about this poked face up, up top here, but I'm, I'm sure I can probably change it later or, or you know do a Z remesh on it, so I'm not going to worry about it. So anyway, Control W makes a polygroup, show that. And here in the same way, just, you know, as it has a nice contour, you know, sort of shape, I can do the same thing I was doing earlier, uh, hitting that geometry, uh, going down into edge loop, do a group loop on the area, ah, multiple subdivisions. So delete lower, and now I can group loops, oops, sorry, need to delete hidden, sorry, delete hidden on the rest, uh, or split hidden, sorry, you can use both. If you don't want to delete the rest of the shape, uh, split, right? Uh, but if you don't care if you have it or not, you know, just go ahead and delete hidden on it, right? Um, but, cool thing is, if I make a shape this way, and I'm kind of getting around this in the roundabout way, but I can do all, everything that I was doing before, Bam, and then we'll just Z remesh this piece just really quick. We'll make this uh, zero, or one, and adaptive up to here. That's fine. Z remesh it really quick. Right, so that's kind of worked out, and then. Again, using that same method of uh, creating a back face, just to give it a, the piece some thickness. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, panel loop it once. Uh, I'm going to make this 0 0.045 a little thicker. Panel loop it, right? So now that we have a shape, we have a shape that we can work with. If I was to go ahead, hide this, hide this, uh, I'm going to crease again. Where's my crease? Ah, there we go. Uh, increase PG. Look at it. It's a nice, you know, pretty fairly hard piece. Uh, and if I wanted to even go ahead and uh, dynamesh it, so 
I know higher it's gonna hold its crease so I'll apply it and then with that I'll delete lower so it's really hard a lot of resolution to that mesh right uh, take it and dynamesh it maybe if you wanted to uh, so I'll go ahead and polish it no blur uh, use project and then maybe I might use like a I don't know, 580 which will turn to 584 dynamesh it we'll see how that that shape holds up right so my guess is that the mesh would be pretty dense and it'll probably soften out ever so slightly with dynamesh oh came out pretty clean look at that so now you could shape this you could sculpt it up so I'm gonna use something like clip curve and I'm still getting to your question uh, but I wanted to just like take something as sort of a basic start and trim it up and show how you could sculpt something of a hard surface piece there we go using different uh, camera angles moved around to create you know the hard cut of the contour there we go so super clean piece right chopped it's got some nice corners to it you can even redynamesh it And now, of course, because you have your Sculptress Mode, uh, which I don't know why my Sculptress Mode is actually not active, I think. Oh, you can bear with me for right here for a second. Uh, I'm going to restore my standard UI. There we go. All right, so uh, for some reason my UI got mixed up. I'm not sure why, but I just reset it. Uh, besides the gizmo, like if I was to hit some clay brushes, you see, there we go. If I started using some clay brushes, and I wanted to sculpt in some extra details, I could now use the sculptor mode, right? Which, uh, as you can see on the mesh, if I really zoom in here, depending on how big the brush size is. Um, I can actually create more geometry or less. So like if I wanted a wide area of geometry, once I smooth it, it's gonna give me a pixel density uh, that is kind of relative to my brush size. If I make it smaller and hold shift and start smoothing, I'm gonna get a lot of detail. So what's cool about this is I could make extra geometry or resolution into details. Uh, and say if I was to go back high poly frames and I was to look at this you can see some of the, the the faces the faceting from the tessellation right so you could smooth this out using sculptress by adding more geo or in places where I have more geo I can make better uh, sculpted details like uh, if I was to use that same mock-up brush sort of in the area where Right? It's going to be a sharper line. <laughs> Excuse me. It's going to be a sharper line where I added more resolution. If I did it off in the other area, it's probably a little bit more jaggy around the edge. So I can actually soften this up. I can actually lower the brush even more, soften these details up with a really fine tessellation, and then try it again and see how clean that is versus if I did it over here where there isn't tessellation it's a little bit more gnarly like especially around on the edges right and that's how sort of like you can change some of the details I'm sure even uh, if you had used the tessimate feature which I believe is almost like a decimation master but you could tessimate the whole thing uh, I've only played with this a little bit so I can't really 
get that in depth in it, but this is something that I'm messing around with that's new to ZBrush that uh, I hope to be actually carrying over into some other streams, but uh, maybe with something organic next time. Anything that you have changed with your modeling? Well, yeah, so using Sculptress and using uh, Testimation, uh, you can actually use Testimation, uh, like the Sculptress brush, brush on decimated mo <laughs> models. Uh, and clean them up like if they have areas that are you need to kind of smooth out you can use the sculptress brushes to actually add back detail back into a, a concentrated area and it'll the rest of the decimation will still be optimized so that's actually kind of cool because you can adjust your brush size and you can sort of get like a, a rough smooth out and work it work things out with design uh, let's do like that And then as soon as you lower the brush, you get more resolution from the pixels, as you can see here. So there's a difference in between uh, the tessellation scale that's going on here and what's going on here. It's much more finite, right? So that way you can kind of, you know, work stuff out and work stuff in or work in uh, higher amounts of detail. Right. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a cool thing. Like, uh, so you can pluck out your geo and then you know you can shape it up <coughs> and rough re-rough stuff out uh, using testimation which is really cool that will be a big bank uh, uh, game changer there's also some things within the deformations that I haven't even really messed I'm still trying to get a handle on again so I, I can't uh, really advise on them just quite yet <laughs> so you'll have to give me a minute Anybody have any other questions that you wanted to ask? But even, even with a shape like this, one cool thing that you can do to sort of keep some of your shapes as you rework them, uh, if you're not going to decimate it, <coughs> you can go into uh, the stroke menu. Uh, let me see here, stroke. <coughs> Under cu curve functions, curve, uh, you can turn on curve mode and <coughs> frame it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and sometimes when you frame it, <coughs> what it'll do is it'll go around the contour. Uh, let's see, crease stages, any crease stages in there? Nah. We'll just stick to border and polygroup. And when I frame it, uh, I can use that <coughs> with the curve strength of the Z modeler. So maybe rather than the adaptive, I'll use curve strength. <coughs> and then just for giggles, I'll uh, freeze the border, keep the target count the same, and see what happens. How would I add another hard surface shape? Um, you could use panel looping. In fact, um, one of the things that I've been messing around with is using a, there was a, a Chi Vang sort of technique uh, where he would use uh, polygrouping and <coughs> inserting insert meshes into the polygroup uh, by mask. Um, <coughs> that one is, I still have to test it out to really uh, get a feel for how it works, but you can use certain insert meshes uh, to make an effect uh, of change on, on a mesh. Um, and I can actually show it. But I'm sort of waiting for this zebra mesh to finish happening here, and then I'll, I'll definitely try to show you what I mean. Oh, yes. So a lot of times, um, you'll have to give me a second, my machine is caught and zero measure for a second. But if I, out of the time that we have, we have about 10 minutes left, I'll try to show you again. Or at the end of the stream, try to scrub back through and have a look. But uh, there's two times probably I've done a shaping like this. So basically, a shape like this just comes out of a, a contour shape. So I chose a sphere. 
uh, and then drew a mask and then changed that mask into a polygroup uh, and then added thickness by way of poly, uh, excuse me, panel looping it. Uh, but if you have different polygroups, you can use also slicing. Uh, so that was like kind of one of the last uh, little contouring bits that I wanted to show, uh, which is actually really cool. And you can do it on a, an existing mesh. So like, if you wanted to build up forms, oh yeah, <laughs> coming soon to break time. But uh, you can say, uh, make a contour out of another contour. Let me, see, let me see if I can just do this. I'm actually going to kill that zero mesh because it's taking too long. But I'll just show you this really quick. So let's say, for example, we delete these curves. And uh, I want to cut a design already out of the existing design. And so one of the ways that we could do this is we could use the slice brush. And you would think. Oh, a slice might be difficult because it doesn't actually maintain symmetry. It only works on one affected side. But that really is the only side that you kind of need. So uh, you could grab a slice. In fact, here, uh, hide the rest of this. And I'm going to actually go into modify topology and just delete hidden. Right, so all of the panel looping that I did before, I'm just going to kill it. Right. I just want the contour out of the shape. So <clears throat> to tailor it even more, I could use slices. So I'm going to use the slice curve really quick. And I'm going to take and do sort of a design on one side. So and you look at these and they look kind of, you know, like, well, whatever. Actually, you know, actually, pull it, pull it. Go back one. I'll do it like this. There we go. So I'll cut a piece there. Uh, and I'm doing these in simple cuts because a lot of times uh, cuts that have too many pieces of variation in them don't work out very well. Like if you make a difficult cut and then double tap alt and then start going in someplace else, it doesn't always work out all that great. So I'm just gonna slice these here. And there we go, there's enough. So let's say I wanted this piece here. So now that I have these slices, I can select which ones that I wanna get rid of. And we'll keep this and this. So let's say I want this nice little piece here. I can even chop it up a little bit more. So I'll kill this and this. That makes the shape a little bit more interesting. Uh, I can polygroup it together. Uh, and I can do the same trick with uh, using like um, using the same trick uh, with using a, a Z remesher. So uh, do that. Set this to like 80 really fast. Curve strength, I'll leave it 50. Polygon count, it's down to one, so I believe it's about 1,000. So this each each number of this is like 1,000. And so like sometimes you'll see me go 0, 05, that's probably like in and around 500 polys. So, 0 0.5, so maybe we'll change it. Uh, and before I do that, I'm gonna just uh, group loops on it really quick. Oops, sorry. Gotta delete hidden. So I'm gonna delete hidden on it, and now I'm gonna group loop, and then I'm going to Z remesh it. There we go. So now we have that more simple piece of Geo, and then again, panel looping. So I can change, actually no, none of these values have changed. So just one loop, no polish, no bevel, uh, going inwards in the negative 100. Oop, sorry, quick save. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, so this is, this is similar to what I showed earlier. But now, you know, just using slicing, I can actually pull out another contour. 
So it's just you, you could just show hide, maybe split hidden uh, in that regard, and get a separate uh, sub tool piece that you can pluck out, uh, and then you could, you know, uh, maybe even through some creative uh, slicing, you could mask off uh, certain polygroups. Uh, so in other words, showing and hiding, you can join some of the polygroups and repolygroup them together to get some larger uh, contoured shapes. Uh, and then once you have it plucked out like this, you can see remesh the piece and then just quickly use panel loops to generate some thickness, right? And so, you know, editing this piece, once you have a, a, just a solid block out of this, you could hide the outside face and the inside face. Uh, and again, you know, I did things like uh, using the Z modeler tool to create or an effect like a, a sort of like almost like a, the same as a, a panel looped bevel. Uh, so, you know, I'll do insert here. And so I'll create another edge. And of course there was that uh, creasing. So now if you look at this, because there's a reinforcement loop on the inside, if I was to you know uh, use dynamic subdivision, this edge is actually much softer, right? Because the, the distance of the loop is actually a little bit further away. Uh, if you wanted to change that, you know, of course you could use the Z modeler's slide on edge selection. So edge hovering over the edge, spacebar, and then slide, and then you can, from that, do edge loop complete, move your loops around, come on, maybe the resolution is so high it's giving me, oh, it's very close to the edge, so you can slide this down, there we go, and as it slides, all of these handles pop up, but uh, what I actually wanted to do something actually quite different. <clears throat> that would be to take this and this, hide it, and then I did um, from visibility, shrink it, polygroup it again, and then use uh, something like QMesh, the full step, and a poly loop, <clears throat> and I selected the face and you know, push it in or out. And actually, I could see some loops actually converging a little bit too hard on that. So what I'm going to do is hit the W, control click in there, uh, and then under deformation, I'm going to actually polish by groups. Maybe that'll loosen it up a little bit. After I pushed it in, clear the mask, Z modeler brush again, get a crease, and I'll do complete edge loop, click, get one there. Everywhere I want like just a sharp edge on the inside and outside. There we go. Probably there's something in here that's a little bit too smoothed out, but you can always fix that by reinforcing it later. Probably one of these uh of these loops here. I'll probably do that and that. And then view it. Maybe use one of these manipulators to pull the edge out so it's a little bit more flush. But that's essentially the, the way that I was manipulating some of this geometry. Like um, just using slicing, uh, masking to pluck out a hard shape, uh, and then refining that. Cool. Alrighty guys, well, thanks for joining me. Um, as soon as I get a chance, I'm going to try to go into uh, the, the ZBrush Central. I think there's a post that I have going. I actually probably need to fix a few things in there. But um, a lot of times as I'm progressing through some of these projects to sort of show you guys some extra footage and whatnot, uh, I actually have a lot of video that I need to compress for you guys and show there. But uh, let me actually find it. There's a link. Somebody actually posted it for me last time, so I really appreciate that. But there's a link that I have going uh, where I'm going to, temporarily at least, I'm, I'm putting up some of the previews of some of this stuff. Um, but if you look for me or search for me on uh, Zebra Central, I'm sure you could probably find the link for it. Okie doke. 
All right, guys, have a great weekend. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for uh, <clears throat> Pixelogic. And I hope everybody has a chance to have some uh, good fun with uh, 2018. And I hope to talk about it with you again. All righty, have a good weekend. Cheers, guys. Thanks again. Oh, uh, sorry. For last question, streaming schedule on the channel. Uh, take a look at the Pixelogic ZBrush Live site. I believe <coughs> also there's a face Facebook group uh, that has information on uh, future streams, uh, which probably will be announced soon. I'm not sure. Uh, <coughs> Kyle over at Pixelogic does the scheduling. But I would say uh, pressed to the Pixelogic site uh, for ZBrush Live. Uh, and I believe they have a feed as well on Twitter. So uh, do look and check it out. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. Have a good weekend. Happy Easter.